Welcome back to the Algebra 2 Jungle, and we're back better than ever. Where tonight we're going to try to model uh, using sinusoidal functions. And sinusoidal, again, is kind of a big fun word to say. And it basically is just a combination of cosine and sine functions. And tonight we're going to apply them to some real life scenarios. Specifically, um, at, eventually we're going to get to a point where we try to model the height of one of the cars on the Ferris wheel as it goes around, um, you know, and reaches its highest point and works its way back down to its lowest point. And so we're going to try to model the height of this car with respect to time as it goes around. But before we get to that fancy Ferris wheel question, we want to just kind of review how to write the um, the equation of a sinusoidal graph uh, based off of a picture that's given to us and we've got some challenging ones here that I want to run you through and a couple of questions that are going through my mind as I get ready to write these equations is number one I'm, I'm often asking myself where is the midline it, and uh, sometimes it's just as simple as the x-axis or sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's a little lower, but I think that's always the first question that goes through in my mind and that's going to lead into question number two and help me decide Am I working with a sine curve or am I working with a cosine curve? And that's pretty much determined on with a sine curve, you'll see the curve start right on the midline. With a cosine curve, you'll see it either start above or below the midline, but not on it. After that, we're just talking, we're looking at things like amplitude, uh, you know, what is the distance between the highest point and the midline, or uh, maybe something like the frequency. And we've talked about before how the frequency and the period are tied together. Sometimes you really don't need to worry about the period. It's, it's really the frequency we need in order to write the equation. So I think we can go ahead and try a couple of these rascals here right off the bat using that checklist that we just mentioned. So a couple of things I'm looking for is my midline's right here in the x-axis. So I don't have any vertical shift to worry about. And because the graph starts right here, we, we definitely know it's a cosine curve. Um, and it looks like the amplitude must be three units because of this distance right here so we know the amplitude's three now here comes the really fancy part notice where we finish that first cycle we're about halfway done and bang right there this is where we finish our first cycle and that's right at pi over two so what that tells you is let's see well the second cycle would be finished this would be right at pi so the frequency asks us, well, how many cycles did you finish at 2 pi? And so we're kind of projecting, we're kind of forecasting as if if we were to extend the x-axis further, we'd see four cycles at 2 pi. So there's your frequency. Let's see if we can put it all together here. And I'm going to try to squeeze it in. Let's see, I need my amplitude. It's a cosine function. And in parentheses, we're going to put our frequency in there, 4x. And then just for emphasis, I'm going to put a plus zero because there was no vertical shift because of where the midline was on this particular question. All right, next question. Um, let's see, again, best news yet, our midline is again on the x-axis, so we don't have to worry about a vertical shift yet. Um, it looks like it's starting right on that midline, so we're now we're working with a sine curve whose amplitude is 5. Now, interestingly enough, let's see, if that's pi over 4, also known as 45 degrees, then this is pi over 2. And if I keep going, let's see, this would be pi. So we're finishing our first cycle at pi. If, if we were to project how many cycles we'd see at 2 pi, I'd say they were going to see two cycles. So we'd end up going, we'd reach our uh, max, we'd come back down, and we'd finish right there at 2 pi. So let's see what we got here. I've got 5 sine of 2x. Again, plus 0 because we didn't have to worry about a vertical shift. But don't worry about putting the plus 0 on yours. Number 12 here. Let's see, my midline, once again, is just the x-axis. So we don't have to worry about a vertical shift. It's starting right on the midline, so we're working with a sine curve. And it looks like it's going down first. And so we've got an amplitude of two units. And I'm going to go ahead and negate that because we went down first. So we got negative 2 sine of something. Now, for me, this is the trickiest one by a long shot. So here's pi over 3. Sometimes we call that 60 degrees. Now, what you'll notice is if you double that 60, that puts you at 120 right here. So you're finishing your first cycle at 120. Now, the question is, how many cycles will we see at 2 pi, or how many cycles will we see at 360? Well, 360 divided by 120, and I'm going to do that right off to the side. So 360 represents 2 pi, and we saw our first cycle right there at 120. 
So that means you're going to see a total of three cycles by the time you hit 2 pi. So we got a frequency of 3, bang, and no vertical shift to worry about. Let's see, number 13. Where's your midline? Midline's right there on the x-axis. Once again, it starts way below the midline. So we're working with a cosine curve, and it looks like um, each of these hash marks is two units. So we've got an amplitude of 4, and I'm going to negate it because we started below the midline. Now what's our frequency here? A little different ball game. Little, um, let's see, we finished one cycle right here at 2. Not 2 pi, but at 2. So here's what you know. We know that the period is equal to 2. And the period formula that we used back in the day was 2 pi divided by f. So what if I substituted this 2 for p and tried to solve for the frequency? And this is something we could have done on the earlier problems, but I thought it was easy enough to just kind of figure it out in our heads. If I cross multiply it, I get 2f equals 2 pi. Divide both sides by 2, and my frequency is a pi. So it always gets a little funkier when your frequency is in terms of pi, but we can handle that. That's just simply, notice I just put the, the uh, pi is the coefficient of x right there. Things are going to get a little bit trickier here. On number 14, it looks like my midline is right here at y equals 1. So this is the first one where we've got to worry about a vertical shift. It does look like the curve is starting right on that midline, so we've got a sine curve with an amplitude of 1. So I'm going to get that jotted down. So we got an amplitude of 1, it's a sine curve. Now all i got to do is worry about the frequency. Now what we got cooking here is it's finishing its first cycle right here at um, right here at 1. Okay, so the period's a 1, and I'm going to do the same thing I did on the last problem. I'm going to substitute that 1 for the p. I'm going to set it equal to 2 pi divided by f. And by the time I cross multiply, the frequency is 2 pi. So we got 2 pi multiplied by x, and there's your equation. Whoops, don't forget the vertical shift, up 1. We got one more to go here. Now again, they're counting by 2's on this y-axis, and I believe the midline's right here at y equals negative 4. You'll notice the curve is starting way above it, so we've got a cosine function with an amplitude of two units. So we got two cosine of something, and now I just got to get my frequency. Um, let's see, we finished our first cycle right here at what I would call the fourth hash mark right here. If I stopped at the third hash mark, the curve wasn't quite done. I got to go to the fourth hash mark. So the period is four. And I could say, well, 4 equals 2 pi divided by f, cross multiply, and then divide both sides by 4, and your frequency is going to be pi divided by 2. So I've got pi divided by 2 multiplied by x, bang, and i got to shift it down 4 units, minus 4, and there's my final cosine function. Okay, so here's our first real big bear for the night. Like we kind of uh, alluded to at the beginning of the video, we're going to try to model the height of one of these cars on the Ferris wheel. And so what they start they said the Ferris wheel has a radius of 25 feet and it's rotating at a rate of 3 revolutions per minute. And that'll be very important. We'll try to help you interpret that in a few minutes. Now at t equals 0, the chair starts at the lowest position. So we're right down here at the very bottom at t equals 0. And that just happens to be 5 feet above the ground at that moment. And then we're going to write a model for the height um, of the chair as a function of time. Now here's the deal, if I'm five feet above the ground right now, when I'm right here, I'm gonna say I'm 30 feet above the ground because it's five plus 25, the, the five feet to begin with, and then the radius had a height of 25 right here, so I'm now 30 feet above the ground. And then when I get to the very tip top, I'm now 55 feet above the ground. We had a radius of 25 plus another radius of 25 plus the initial five feet. Um, as I rotate back, I'm now 30 feet above the ground here, and back to the beginning, I'm 5 feet above the ground, and that would be considered one revolution or one full cycle. Um, now, what I'm going to do first is I always start with by trying to find the period, and that's based off of the number of revolutions we're going to make in one minute. Here's my thought process. If I make three revolutions in one minute, also known as 60 seconds, if I divided that 60 by 3, that's going to tell me I make one revolution in 20 seconds. All right. 
and this number right here is the period. So that's the amount of time it takes to complete one revolution. Now ironically, similar to what we did on the last slide, if we know that the period is 2 pi divided by f, we could substitute the 20 for p and say, well, 20 equals 2 pi divided by f, cross multiply, and then divide both sides by 20, and 2 pi divided by 20 reduces to pi over 10, and there's your frequency. So we kind of got that part out of the way. Now that's going to help me kind of start to sketch this, this story here that we have. So if the period, if it takes me 20 seconds to complete one cycle, I'm going to set up my x-axis based off of uh, 0 to 20, and 10 would be right in the middle. And we started at an initial height of 5 feet. Um, now, let's see. The, I'm going to reach the maximum height at 10 seconds. So at 10, we said, what were we? We were 55 feet above, and then at 20 would be the completion of the first cycle, so I'd be back to where I started. And so my curve is going to kind of look like this. And now we, using this picture, I think we could help us find the midline. And that's my number one question right now is, where is the midline? What is the equation of the midline? And here's the little formula that I like to use. And this is really short and sweet. I'm going to take my maximum height. I'm going to add it to my minimum height. I'm going to divide by 2. And that's going to equal my midline. And I'm going to use the letter D for midline here. Notice I use a capital M for max and a minimum, or lowercase m for minimum. And I could label those. Those were 5 feet here. And 55 was my max. So I'm going to do 55 plus 5, I'm going to divide it by 2. In other words, what we're doing is we're finding the average. And 60 divided by 2 is 30. So right here, in the middle, is y equals 30. So I think we're ready to put it all together now. It is a cosine function because it begins below the midline. The distance here uh, between 30 and 5 is 25. And I'm going to negate it because it's below. We already said the frequency is pi over 10, multiply that by x, and then throw on our vertical shift at the very end. And there's the equation that models the height of the chair with respect to time, where time is measured in seconds. One of the things that a lot of these modeling problems have in common is that they are circular in nature, just like the Ferris wheel is a circle. Now we've got this paddle wheel on an old riverboat is circular as well. And uh, the paddle wheel on the SS Beaver has a 13 feet diameter, and it revolves 30 times per minute when moving at top speed. Um, using this speed and the starting point from the very uh, top of the wheel, write a model for the height of the end of the paddle relative to the water's surface as a function of time. Now here's a, also a helpful point. They said assume the paddle is two feet below the water surface at its lowest point. That's very helpful. But let's work back here. We'll start with the revolutions and, um, whoops, not the feet there, the revolutions. And that's going to help us determine the period and the frequency. So if we make 30 uh, revolutions in one minute, also known as 60 seconds, if I divide 60 by 30, that's going to tell me I make one revolution every two seconds. And this right here is the period. Again, we'll substitute that for p, and we'll say 2 equals 2 pi divided by f. By the time we cross multiply, we'll find out that the frequency is just pi. Okay, so that'll be helpful in a few seconds. Now, the other thing we want to work on here is kind of generating a little graph. Don't forget that it was the radius, or the, I'm sorry, the diameter is 13 feet. So let's see what we got cooking here. So it took two seconds to finish one cycle. And let's see. Now if this whole diameter is 13 feet, and the very lowest point is 2 feet below the water, then the very highest point is going to be 11 feet above the water. And so I'm going to start right up here at 11. At my very lowest point, I'm going to be two feet below the water, so I'll call this negative two, and I'm always going to finish where I started. Um, so my function's going to look a little bit like this, maybe. And you'll notice it starts to look like a cosine function because I'm going to say my midline's right in this neighborhood right here, and because above, 
starts above that midline, it's a cosine curve. The question is, what is, I'll put a couple question marks here, what is the equation of that midline? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my maximum height, I'm going to add it to my minimum height, and divide by 2. In other words, giving me the average. And so 9 divided by 2 gives me 4.5, and unfortunately I'm working with decimals, but that's okay. We've certainly seen worse than that. 4.5. Alright, let's see if we can put this all together here. We said it's a cosine function, and looks like the distance from 11 to 4.5 is going to be, let's see, about 6.5. So we'll go 6.5 for an amplitude. We've got our cosine function. We know that the frequency is pi multiplied by x, and then we're going to shift it up 4.5 units. And right there is the function for modeling the height of the end of that wheel relative to the water's surface. Here's our last modeling problem for the night, and the theme here is the ocean tides. And they said the height of the water in a bay varies sinusoidally over time. Again, sinusoidally, very fun word to say. On a certain day off the coast of Maine, the high tide is 10 feet, and it occurred at 5 in the morning. And then there was a low tide of 2 feet, which occurred at 1 in the afternoon. Write a model for the height in feet of the water as a function of time, or hours since midnight. Now this particular question has a, an extra component to it that we haven't seen yet, and that's going to involve a horizontal or a phase shift in conjunction with the vertical shift and the amplitude and the frequency and all those other things we've been talking about. Now if I try to draw this picture, and I think the kicker is, is that T is measured in hours since midnight. So midnight would be zero, and the first, the high tide occurred at 5 a.m., that would so that'd be five hours since midnight. So my very first points are going to occur at 5, and that was my high tide at 10 feet. So I'll put my 10 right here. Now, the low tide didn't occur until 1 in the afternoon, which is, if we think how many hours since midnight, well, that was 13 hours since midnight. And, and that was 8 hours, actually, after 5 o'clock, if you want to think of it that way. And the height of the water was now 2 feet. So I'll put the 2 on there. And that's only going to give me half a cycle. If I'm picturing how, of course, we're not going to connect these with a straight dot. Anytime they say sinusoidally, we're thinking about changes in concavity and things like that. And I'm picturing my curve doing something like that. So that's only half. Now, again, the time span here was about eight hours. So I'm going to need to go another eight hours to get a full cycle. And that's going to put me at, let's see. 21 hours where I finally get back to my high tide so the curve is looking something like this now the question is where's my midline we want to find the average of the low tide and the high tide and so if I find the average of 10 feet and 2 feet uh, that turns out to be 6 feet so y equals 6 and that's just me doing 10 plus 2 divided by 2 and that turns out to be 6 Again, you'll notice how the curve starts above the midline. So we're working with a cosine function in the distance right there between 10 and 6. Make a note there. That's 4 units, so that's my amplitude. Y equals 4 cosine. All right. Now we've got to figure out what the frequency was. And I'm going to scoot down here to do a little bit of scrap work. Now, the question, you notice how it took eight, or I'm sorry, 16 hours to complete one cycle? Let's see, because we had eight hours on each side. So we know that the period is 16 hours to complete one cycle. You know, and that's starting at high tide, going to low tide, back to high tide. So here's the deal. If that's my period, I could substitute that and solve for the frequency. And by the time I cross multiply, and then divide both sides by 16, the frequency turns out to be pi over 8. So, we'll go pi over 8, but I need two sets of parentheses because I have to incorporate the phase shift. My curve um, got shifted 5 units to the right, so I'm going to go x minus 5 to move it 5 to the right, and then I can go plus 6 for that vertical shift. So that's a very high-tech one of the extra component of shifting it horizontally to the right five. Um, we'll get a chance to practice a couple of those tomorrow. We'll be able to talk them out and smooth over any um, tricks that uh, might seem confusing right now. Now, I've got one more slide for you. 
And here's this last slide. And basically, I want to offer this as an extra credit opportunity. There's six questions on here that I want you to evaluate. And I'll put this at the top. So what we're doing is we're trying to evaluate the value of each of these expressions. And uh, some of them are trickier than others. And, um, and what we can do is you can just do it like on an index card or something similar to the size of an index card. Put your name on there. And for each one that you're able to get correct, and I do need to, I'm going to ask you to show all work. Some of them require like two steps. Some of them might be four steps, but they're small steps. And uh, we're going to turn that in, and we're going to offer, um, if you got all six correct, we'd offer six extra credit points on the next quiz. And so, you know, if you can do three, do three. And every point will count, and it doesn't hurt to try. you got nothing to lose. So I'd encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. And hopefully we could add six points to your next quiz, uh, which uh, this year is probably going to fall on Monday. Or, I'm sorry, Wednesday. Good luck, and I'll catch you tomorrow.